So today, uh, I'm going to talk about archery form and how to find it. I just did a camp, a big Christmas camp, and all of the archery team came over and I took an entire group through what it is that I'm going to explain to you today. And essentially, let's see, I wonder if I turn this around this way. There we go. So right from the start, I need to tell you that I'll try not to walk around too much so you don't have to. <laughs> what decides whether if that shot's going to hit or not? Is it going to be stable? Is your release going to go off? Uh, will everything behave immediately when you look through the peep site? Will everything be working the way that you expect it to? All is determined by what you do before you pull the bow back to full draw. And most people shorthand that step. They grab an arrow out of their quiver, looking around, they load it, and then they pick it up and pull it back. And then they get really serious about getting the peep. And, and then they start trying to shoot their bow. Not shorthanding that first step where you put your fingers into the release and get that fit exactly right. When you put your hand in the bow and get that fit exactly right, then set yourself up in a shooting position, the position that you want to be in when you're going to shoot the bow before you even raise it up to pull, pull back. You'll find that if you're just studious, if you don't do anything I say today, you just do that one thing, you'll find you'll get some consistency that you can actually sight in. It won't be all over the place. Your form could not really be super correct, and you can just turn the knobs until it hits because it'll be consistent because your setup is good, right? Okay. <clears throat> so first, we'll clear up a couple of misconceptions. Form dictates how stable you're going to be, not your stabilizers. And you're thinking, well, why would my stabilizers, there we go, now I can hear it, right? Why would my stabilizers not keep me still? Well, actually, what the, bow, what the stabilizers are on the bow for, they're not there, thank you, they're not there to make your aim steady. They're there to keep the bow still while the arrow is leaving the bow. Because you're at full draw, everything's all set up. You may have some skin-generated torque in the grip. You may have some face pressure on the string. You might be mashing against it. You might be pushing your heel. You may be sticking your uh, thumb into the throat. of the There may be a mistake there. And wherever the pin is when that release aid opens, you want the stabilizers to keep the bow in that state while it's changing shape and the string is falling and that torque that you wound up against the grip is trying to release and turn the bow. It's just as soon as the release aid open, it opens is when you have absolutely zero control anymore. The weight is there to keep that bow absolutely still. So the first thing that you need to know, does your bow shoot a bullet hole through the paper or whatever tear you have it set up for, will it shoot the exact same tear with and without weight on the bars? Can you take the bars off of the bow and it still shoot a hole? If it does, your stabilizers are stabilizing the bow. But if you set that bow up and get a crispy little bullet hole without weight on the bars and then you put your weight on and it begins to tear, that doesn't mean the tune isn't right on your bow. That means the weight, as soon as the release aid opens, the weight is moving your bow, right? Okay. Form drives everything from start to finish. How tense 
are your muscles while holding the bow at full draw? How hard are your hands? How rigid are your legs when you're standing there at full draw? You've seen people when they, they're trying so hard to get the form exactly right and they're so stiff and so hard that they're just vibrating. Everybody's seen that before, right? And I call that the uh, high school tuxedo syndrome, right? Have you ever seen a kid, he puts on a tuxedo to go to prom and he's walking around like this, afraid that he's gonna wrinkle the suit, right? And you may feel that same thing if you take that suit off, you're like, oh, whew, now I can relax, right? Have you ever got done with an archery round and we're like, whew, now I can relax? That's a signal that you may be holding everything a little bit too rigid. If you're exhausted by the time you get done with a 30 arrow round, something's not quite right. And again, it's good to know that if anything hurts, while you're shooting your bow, chances are if you get done shooting and you've got a pain in the top of your shoulder or if you've got something like that going on, there's a strong chance there may be a form issue there that's causing that particular impingement or muscle pain or whatever it is. So look closely. If you hurt when you get done shooting your bow and you don't have other, some other extenuating circumstance, it's probably an issue with your form. Short draw length, long draw length, peep sight too low. Those are the most common ones that make people hurt when they get done shooting, right? Age, you know, uh, I'm, I'm figuring that out right about now. So, let's see, let me back up. I think I skipped something. Okay, so we need to figure out where we are. You know, in a perfect world, you'll all go home with this information, you'll get your bows out and you'll go, all right, Let's see what we've got going on here and what it is that we need to fix. Because hopefully when this is over, I'll have you all loaded up with the what to do based on what you see. So that way you'll know. And how many coaches do we have in the room? Okay, so a good many. So coaches, if you're training someone and you give them these tips, there's, there's, there's two things. There is the coaching cue the thing that you look for that tells you what it is that they're doing and the thing that you tell them that gives them the idea what does it feel like when it's right or what should they see and always try to tell them what it should feel like when it's correct rather than what it is that you're looking for because often I hear coaches say, I wanna see your release end up in a straight line because that indicates, you know, whatever. And you'll see shooters misuse a release and then they make the straight line. I'm sure everybody's seen that at some point or another. So telling them what you're supposed to see won't necessarily get them closer to getting it right. You need to tell them what they should feel or come up with some training exercise that will demonstrate to them what they should feel. So I can go through some of those too. But step one, take all the weight off of your stabilizer bars. It is shocking to me when I go do a seminar, I go to somebody's pro shop and I do a big seminar, it's shocking to me when I find out how many people have actually never shot their bows with just the bars on and no weight. So they don't have any idea what the raw stability of their bow actually is. So when you take all the weight off the bars, you get to see the uncorrected movement. What is your form giving you? What do you get when you pull your bow back to full draw, right? The shape and the speed of the pin movement, how fast the pin moves, how much space, that it covers on the target? Is it going in a circle? Is it going up and down? Is it moving left or right? You can see all of that and it is absolutely clear what's going on. If you have it right, or if you make a tiny change in your form, you'll see the immediate effect in your sight movement. So that way you can tell right away 
is this thing that I'm doing making me more accurate or not, right? And that's important. When you're training, trying to make your release work better, you're trying to make your bow more stable, you're just trying to make your form clean and make it work for you, if you're doing that with 10 pounds of weight on your bars, you're making it take way longer than it should because having all that weight on the bar, you can't see the cause and effect of the form changes that you're making. If you have it down, if you have it perfect, you can shoot your same high score without any weight on the bar at all. And that's the big flex in our archery shop. If somebody shoots a 300, they write their name on it and what bow they did it with and you know the date and all that kind of fun thing. But the final big flex that they make is they write no weight. Meaning I did this without any weight on my bars, therefore I'm better than you, viewer, who is you looking at this awesome score hanging on the wall, right? So being able to shoot your score without weight, that gives you an immediate idea of how healthy is your form, how good is it working for you, and if there, are there any changes that need to be made. And with anyone um, in a growth state, like if you train juniors and they're 13, 14 years old and their draw length is changing daily, I have them check in with that taking the weight off the bars. I have them check in on that every other week. When they're about 16, 17, 18, I have them check in with that every month. All the adults, I have them check in any time their score takes a dip or any time they're having one of those days that they just can't hit anything, take the weight off the bar and figure out what you got going on and you'll learn something immediately, right? So that's one of the biggest tools that no one uses is shooting your bow with uncorrected balance, no weights on the bars whatsoever. So step one, take the weight off. Step two, you're gonna shoot your bow a little bit and you'll do it for a significant amount of time. It won't do just to take it off, shoot five or 10 shots and go, yeah, it looks pretty good and then move on, right? Um, shoot it for a good bit, like shoot it for a week without bars and get really good at it. You'll be amazed at what it turns into when you actually walk the weight back on the bar. So you'll look for the speed and the shape and the distance. You look and see how the pin moves, what the bow does at the instant of release. We've all seen the uh, steady aim device or the Mantis, the electronic uh, accelerometer you put on your bow and it'll track what your bow does. You can actually see that through your scope when you take the weight off of the bars. And if you combine that steady aim while training your form, you can then see immediate effect just visually and you have the track on your phone so you can see what's going on there too and you can really geek out on what little things that you do that makes your form work, right? Okay. So step three, you're gonna start training your new skills. You're gonna figure out what does it take to make your bow more steady? And you'll see, I'll go through a lot of the patterns and things that, you, that you'll see, the most common ones. But these are some things right here. Let me move this kind of out of the way a little bit. So um, this bow elbow, what you do with your grip hand when you put it in the bow, your upper torso, how you have that positioned and how hard you're holding the muscle there your forearms, legs, and even your toes. Yes, your toes will actually make a difference and you'll be able to see exactly what happens. You can also do this exercise outdoors in the wind. If any of you are 50 meter shooters and you shoot out in the middle of a field and it gets windy, shoot without weight on your bars. You'll be shocked at how good you do without that weight over traveling when you're in the wind, right? So check that out. Oh, they're standing on these little balance discs. You buy them for Am from Amazon, it's like 20 bucks. And uh, most of the time, people can't feel what position that they're in. 
you know, you'll, you'll see people who pull their bow back like this and they have a really big arch in their back or they may lean forward like this out on their toes. And they, they say, okay, so, so stand up straight, maybe lean forward a little bit when you draw the bow back so that you end up straight up and down. You try all kinds of things and many can't figure it out because they can't feel where they are in space. And you know, let's face it, a lot of us end up in archery because we're not really all that good at other sports, right? So, so we don't have that really good, you know, proprioceptive feel, you know? So by getting these balance discs, it's a really cheap fix. So here's kind of how this balance disc thing goes. You see they're up there with no bows, right? And I'm running them through an exercise going step on and they, find their balance, you know, and their feet are doing this on the, on the disc, step off, step on, step off. And essentially what's that, what that's doing is getting their brain connected to the muscles that create stability. They step on, step off, step on, step off. We go at that for 10 minutes probably until everyone, when I'm like watching the whole group, when everyone can step on and they're immediately stable. It takes folks five minutes or so of step on and step off before they're able to just go and they're stable. So then I go one step farther, all right? Step on, make bow hands. And when they do this, they lose their balance because when we, when we set up in a bow, and we pick it up and we draw it back, we're changing shape, we're changing center of gravity all the way through the entire process in the release, the whole bit. So if you train the basic connection to the ground, that's your balance, right? If you train balance, that'll translate into stability and accuracy with your bow, right? So step on, step off, bow hands, then it goes to make a bow, pretend release, I'll walk them through all of that until they have it stable and under control. Then we'll get the bows, I pull the targets up really close, we get the bows, blank bail, and then we go through that whole procedure, step on with your bow, step off. We go through the whole thing again with the bow in your hand and they'll actually pull it back and anchor and aim and shoot. Watching the ends of their bars while they're standing, you know, on those things, you can see them get steadier and steadier and steadier. Even adults, I have them get those, they set them up and they step on and step off while watching TV at night. They're training their archery while they're having downtime, right? And then if you want to be really advanced, you can hold something in your hands and go through a range of motion while standing on those and you'll be training your balance. So later, maybe you won't be the 100 year old guy with the cane who can't hardly get upstairs without you know, holding on to the handrail as much. That's where I came up with this whole thing is with geriatric patients, they're training balance and they're sitting on a balance ball with their foot on one bladder, you know, a little balance disc and going through these motions. That's kind of where I got this idea. But you'll notice as you're going through that thing, their posture gets straighter and more centered then when they pull their bow back, they'll go from a big giant sway in their back to dart straight just through walking through the, the balance exercise. The only thing that I caution, it's fun to try to shoot their bows at a target off of these things. Caution against that, just blank bail, because if you're trying to hit a bullseye off of that, yeah, it's a fun party trick, but the extra stability problems that you get while you're trying to aim, that might translate into release aid issues later, especially with developmental people, right? So if they do want to try to hit a target, let them do it a couple of times and then go, okay, let's get back to what we were doing and just blank bail and you're trying to maintain stability through the whole thing. That's all you need to do. So trying to shoot your bow off of it is a bit too much. So a couple of quick tips with your setup. When you're putting your fingers on the string or putting your fingers in the release, do that with soft hands. Whether if you've got a finger tab 
Or whether if you have a release aid, it translates dead straight across with both. When you put your hands, you do that with very soft fingers so you can feel what it is that you're doing. If you hold everything tight-fisted, you can't feel where you are. So the more relaxed and supple you are, the more sensitivity you have to where you are in space and what it is that you're doing. And just, just changing the depth of your finger in the release, your index finger, if you change the depth of that finger just an eighth of an inch, it will completely change the speed of your release. So it's a good idea when you're putting your fingers in the release, you're actually looking at it, getting that set, you go, okay, there it is, then put your hand in the bow. Magic trick number one. You can see this absolutely clear when you're shooting your bow. But when you put your hand in the bow, let's see, I'll use this as a little demonstrator. When you put your hand, here's how I tell beginners how to put their hand in the bow, because everybody wants to grab this like a hammer handle, you know, like this, right? And you see where that puts the string, right? And because of the way my wrist moves, it also guarantees that I'm gonna hit myself with it because I'm new, right? So what I do is I go, no, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna hold it like that. Instead, put your hand flat to the floor so that your thumb is below your forefingers. And put, the, put your hand in there flat like this. And here's where the trick comes in. I'm gonna intentionally miss a line. But watch when I put just a little squeezing pressure between my thumb and forefinger. You see how that straightens my forearm with the grip. And I can use biomechanics to make sure that my grip is dead in line with this, the power that I'm putting against it. So I'll tell them, put your hand in flat, give it just a light squeeze, not enough that'll break the egg. And I'll take somebody's hand and I'll go, I'll go do it about this much just to demonstrate how light it actually is or otherwise they'll be holding that a little bit too hard or too rigid. And this works recurve bow or compound. This was actually the first, the first time this tip was given to me, it was shooting a recurve bow. But it works great for compounds too because we don't have any holding weight, right? So hand in flat, light pinch, and then put your hand down against the surface of the grip, get even pressure over the entire grip surface, and just touch the front of the bow with these two fingers like this. Another little tip, when it's windy, do all that a lot harder. You'll find, test it indoors, test it outdoors when it's not windy, you'll find it doesn't change where the arrow hits when you do it right, it doesn't change where the arrow hits, but you get a little bit of resistance against the wind so your bow's not just all over the place. You can actually control to some degree where your pin is and you're not just hoping to hit it. You're actually able to direct it a little bit and keep it on target and get your shot off before you're over on somebody else's target, right? So light squeeze, touch the front. That's all you gotta do. So when, um, Using a, you know, your bow on blank bail or with a piece of string or something like that, you can experiment with how changing the finger depth in the release changes the speed and figure out where you kind of want to be, right? That's, a, that's one of the big things that nobody pays attention to. They just reach in their little pouch and they pull it out, they hook it on, they pull it back, and then they just deal with whatever they get. Question back there in the back. Uh huh. So, if you're inside and the, the little squeeze is a one, what would you say you know, outside would you do? You can go 10 outdoors. Okay. And when it's that windy, you know, we had a couple shoots last year, it was that windy, right? You can go to, if it's just like a one, two indoors just to keep everything quiet, you can go to 10. Because if your hand is in there correctly, and you just increase the pressure there, 
all it does is hold the bow more firm. So when the wind blows against it, your stabilizer can't twist in the wind. That's pretty much what that does. So experiment with that so you know what 10 is, right? You'll figure out, again, no weight on the bars. You can find out immediately where one, two, and where 10 is that fast, right? Because you can see what you're doing, right? So your torso, I kind of went over that a little bit with the balance discs. But one of the steps in our procedure is we hook the release on the string, set the depth, get the hand right, get our feet where we want to be, and we're holding the bow. So just a little shuffle, right? And you go, okay, that's stable, that's what I want. Okay, you're ready. And then you finally put your nose on the target. And at that point is where we'll take a big breath, hold it for a second, and then and kind of relax everything. And your torso with a compound, right? this is where compound and recurve kind of depart a little bit. Your torso with a compound, you want to kind of be stacked on your hips so that you have balance, kind of like a rifle shooter would do, right? With recurve, your stance will be twisted a little bit more toward the target, and you're going to have strong rotation in your gut to help hold that steady because you're holding 45, 50 pounds at full draw instead of 10 or 12, right? So that's why it's different for compound or recurve. But settling your torso and then trying to keep that still when you raise your bow up and pull it back. Having a settled low torso, you'll find that immediately standing on those balance discs. You'll figure out how to do that and make it work. So balance discs and no weight on the bars are probably the two most far-reaching effects into uh, cleaning up your form and getting it more still. Most folks right now, oh, my bow is unsteady. Well, pack more weight on the bar, right? That's not the answer because you'll get to a point, and I have hundreds of people every year go, man, I'm actually shooting better without weight on my bars because they didn't realize that they were working themselves to death just trying to get their bow to work because they pack so much weight on the bar instead of fixing the form, right? So that's key. Forearms, when you're at full draw, there's a little tiny point when you pull the bow back, bink, and you're against the wall, and we'll settle shoulder tops, and we're still holding the bow with tension against the wall, and you can soften, you can maintain the pinch and the press on the front of the riser, but you can still get the feeling that you're softening your forearms. The release won't come out of your fingers because you don't need this under here, right? And having that little bit of tension release, right? That'll make everything a lot more still and your release aid will work like it's got new grease on it. It'll work just right, okay? So the bow elbow. Most folks, when you see them with their bow, they have that extended out there, locked out straight. That creates a few issues because it eliminates several muscle groups that you can use to hold the bow steady. With just a slight unlock with a compound, not recurve, with a slight unlock, you can involve your bicep and tricep into, into the mix of stabilizing your bow. If your elbow is locked out straight, it tends to aim sort of in a circle because you're just dependent on the muscle structure at the base of your arm to hold it steady, and those muscles work in a circle around your arm. So as they are trying to stabilize the bow, your sight ends up tracing a circle, right? So legs and toes, this is another wind tip. It works really well indoors too. If you're freaking out and your arrows are buzzing in your quiver, I know some of y'all probably felt that, right? I was at Lancaster, somehow I messed up, man, ended up in the shoot down at Lancaster. And all of a sudden at the second end, 
my legs started going, right? And I says, man, I can't believe this. I haven't been nervous like this in 25 years. When somebody gets crazy nervous, they go, I'm shaking like crazy and I don't know what to do. One of the things that I say is shake at the X because you can't do anything about the vibration, but you can choose what direction you vibrate in. And you can go from side to side all over the target to reaching that vibration at the middle. And with your legs, just by twisting, just like this inside of your shoes. Can everybody see my feet from where you're at? Let's see, maybe if I get over here. Can y'all see my feet? No? Okay. Let's do this. So just by twisting, you see how my shoes kind of twist to the outside like that? Everybody stand up for a second. So with your feet set and stable, you're not going to actually move your shoes, but you're just going to press to the outside. Can you feel how that activates your legs and stabilizes? So when you're in a tournament and you're freaking out, if you just do that right there, it'll double your stability and it'll help make everything steady. In the wind, you just open that up just a little bit and then put that same twist and it'll help hold steady even when the wind's trying to blow you over, right? Heels out or toes, and toes in? Toes out, toes out, like this. But you can, I like toes out, but try toes in if that works for you. It would still accomplish what it is that we're doing. The reason I like toes out is because it like get, activates all the way up to here, right? Where toes in only gets you down here, right? Okay. Oh, and toes, Outdoor, I'll come to you in a second. Toes, this may sound crazy, but with your stabilizers with no weight on the bars, indoors or outdoors or in the wind, if you just press down against the ground like this with your toes, massive stability change. Just that dumb little thing like that, just press down on the floor with your toes. That used to be one of my little get in your head fun tricks when I'm shooting with my buddies. We're like doing league and we're talking trash and I go, how much pressure do you put against the floor with your toes while you're at full draw? They're done. <laughs> or if you ask them, do you clench your butt cheeks at full draw or do you just leave them natural? And it's over. They can't, they can't even look through their peep side after that, right? So there's another little fun trick. But the toes thing is huge, especially in the wind. Legs plus toes, you'll be locked in, right? And that'll be your best chance at getting close to the yellow when the wind gets kind of crazy, right? And they won't stop the shoot unless it's blowing the targets down the, down the range. So you got to figure out how to do it. So here's form issue. Form issue number one. My bubble won't stay in the middle, right? So when your bubble goes this way, pegs out right-handed shooter, it pegs out this way. Let's see, I don't have an arrow or anything, so I'll just, I'll, I'll use this bow. Okay. So I have a bow here with no stabilizers on it whatsoever. The common fix for bow wants to do this, right, is add more weight over here on the bar. But if you add enough weight on the bar so that this thing winches up straight, what's going to happen as soon as the release aid opens, right? That's that bow for a right-handed shooter. That's that bow that has that right tear in it and you can't figure out what it is. Most of the time when somebody calls me with that, I say, take the bars off and shoot it. And they go, oh, it's a total bullet hole. Fix your bars, not the bow. The bow is good, right? That's usually that's how that works. Here's why the bow gets off center. So if it goes this way, right? Watch what happens when I raise my shoulder just the tiniest bit. When I pick that up just the tiniest bit, it tips the bow over this way, right? Now, on the other side, a lot of coaches give the tip that activate your lat 
on this side, right, like this, to pull your shoulder down. But you can see if I activate my lat, it turns the bow this way. And I end up standing in this kind of posture at full draw and I have a muscle turned on that doesn't have anything to do with me shooting my bow, trying to make this work. The real fix for your bubble is reaching the bow to the target. So this is kind of how this works. If you put your, everybody put your hand up on your shoulder like this, and then bend your elbow, and then raise your bow up in the air like you're gonna draw it back. You see how that shoulder goes up? So if I leave my shoulder still and put my hand down, you see where my shoulder is here, right? That's why everybody on earth has trouble with this because we just pick our bows up with our arms, our elbows bent. We pick our bows up so we start off like this when we pull the bow. Once we're under pressure, we can't really feel that anymore. And we live our lives like this and like this and like this, so this is a normal condition for us most of the day. So then when we have to shoot our bows like this, we can't really get in that position or even feel what it is. So here's the trick. So again, with your elbow bent, right? If you just straighten your arm out and then just relax the shoulder, you feel that go down, and then with just a light reaching force like this, reach like that and raise your arm. You're just reaching the bow. I tell people, try to make the bow closer to the target without leaning toward the target, right? Almost like you're leaning against the counter and you're trying to steal the money out of the cash register, <laughs> right? <laughs> Show me the money, right? <laughs> So if you just a light reach keeps this in place, that's the biomechanics of how your shoulder position works. When you pick the bow up, instead of straight up and then draw like this, if you pick it up and then draw like this, that'll stay down. That's how you get your shoulder in place. To practice the bubble, you can stand at a close range with the blank bail, only looking at the bubble. Pick the bow up, pull it back, eyes are on the bubble, put the pin on the target, anchor, eyes are still on the bubble, going through the shot, looking at the bubble. So you can begin to train yourself what it feels like to shoot your bow with everything in place. It's not just okay, here's what you have to do to get this right, and then you just do it. You actually have to practice being able to do it because the other one feels super natural right now, and it's messing you up. So it'll take a while for the fix to feel natural, right? So can't stress enough, just boring old blank bail. I can't stress enough. But once you get the boring blank bail working and you have everything under control, then you put a target up at very close range, shoot the target at close range and keep the form working and incrementally move the target away from you and keep the form working while you reincorporate the aiming step with the new form. That is key. If you fix something and then jump straight out to 20 and start shooting, the old you is gonna come back in about 10 arrows, if that many, right? So you have to actually train it in and then walk the target away so the fix stays with you because the aiming will change your brain onto something else and you'll slip right back into whatever it is that you've practiced the most, right? So the next form issue, circular instability. I've already gone over that, right? That is elbow locked out or and or a high shoulder because that makes the pin aim in a circle, right? Again, the theme that you're going to hear here today is watching the pen will tell you what it is you need to fix, right? So if you see circular aim, pay attention to your shoulder and your front elbow, okay? So form issue here, left-right instability. 
when you first take your, your uh, weight off of your bars at full draw, your bow will be just humming like this. Some people, it'll be from red to red, right? Other people, it'll just be buzzing in place. That's the perfect time to experiment with that light little pinch. And you'll see immediate change in the stability when you put that light little pinch and you'll be able to figure out what a two is and what a 10 is almost immediately in pressure. Because you'll see the sight get still and you go, okay, that's all I need, right? That's perfect, right there. And if you shoot all day just practicing that one technique, you'll have it down, right? So the next thing is nobody in here has this issue, right? The sight goes down to the bottom and it just like stays there and I can't get the sight up into the middle and it's stuck. Now there's two things. One of them is physical and the other one is psychological. If you can put the pin in the middle and then it leaves as you're trying to shoot, that's most likely physical. If you're raising the pin up into the middle and you got your finger ready and you're raising almost there, almost there, a little bit more, a little bit more, and it stops at the bottom of the yellow and you're like, come on, and your brain goes boom and you shoot it anyway. And next thing you know, you subconsciously just sight your bow end to where when it's sitting below the 10 and you fire it, it hits the middle. I see you nodding your head like, yep, 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 that's me, yep. <laughs> right? It's a, like nobody will admit it, but 75% of the people in this room have some degree of that going on right now. Right? So there's a couple of fixes for that. Magic pill. Yes. Here's the magic pill, and you don't even have to drink it. Right? Here's what you got to do. When you draw the bow back, most people pull the bow, get in the bow, and then they go hunt the target down, wherever it is. And then they find the target, and then they orient, and then they ease up into it, right? It's that easing in that triggers the habit where it freezes just outside the middle. So if you want to change a habit, you got to eliminate the trigger, right? So here's how you do it. When you pull the bow back to full draw, you could look past the peep, it's not even in front of your eyeball yet, and you put the glass on the middle of the target. Then bring the peep into view and look through the peep first before you touch your anchor. And if you do that, you're setting up your shot and the pressure of that shot, you're setting that up on the target. That works especially well, we've all noticed Shooting downhill, the bow is really strong and it pops, you know, really good. Uphill, the bow is really weak and you can't get your release to go off and you can't get it to be steady. That whole pull the bow back and then bend at the waist, I don't know who made that up, but it doesn't work, right? What you need to do is get these two dots lined up with the target before you even pull your bow back. So that way the pressure that you're creating in the shot is actually pointed at the target. So if I need pressure to make my bow hold steady and I need pressure to make my release fire and then I break my line like this, trying to aim up at a target, I lose pressure, draw length, aim and release aid won't work. But if I look at the target, and kind of, I'm holding my bow and I set myself up so that I feel balanced at this angle and then pick my bow up and draw the bow back. You see, I'm already set up on the target. If I say, don't bend, don't pull back level and bend at the waist in Europe, they're like, <gasps> they want to tar and feather and run me out of town, right? And you see them in like pro archery series where they'll pull back and they've got that one that's straight up overhead. And it's like, and you see them bending at the waist, right? So stand up and let's try this. 
So the thing that they want us to do, right, is to draw straight and then bend at the waist. So everybody give that a try and feel the change in the weight on your feet. You see, your back heel has to come up. Next thing you know, you're standing on one foot trying to shoot an arrow out of your tree stand. And the last thing I want to do is be standing on one foot balanced trying to shoot an arrow out of my tree stand, right? So here's how you do that. You know, your tree stand, you can't, you know, get ready like that, but you can just bend your knees and that makes it doable. If you just unlock your knees, then you can bend over, right? Let me get a little bit farther away from that speaker. So then you can bend over and get your shoulders pointed at the target. Try that so you can see the difference. Right? So that way you're ba at least balanced on your feet and your bow will be stable and it'll actually hit what you're aiming at. Try, the, try it on the up where you go this way. Most folks run out of range of motion right about here, right? And we need it to be up there, right? So most of them can't get their bow on the target. So they'll go, y'all can all sit. So you can wobble, 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 miss, wobble, wobble, miss, right? But then you watch Dave Cousins or Jesse Broadwater, or, you know, any of them that know how to do this stuff and they walk up and set their sight and turn around backwards and go like that and pull their bow back. So the other shooters will watch them do that and then they shoot three arrows touching in the middle. They watch them do it and then they walk up and go, right? I don't know about y'all, but I'd take the hint when I saw them beat me that bad, <laughs> right? I'd check that out. So, oh yeah, I'm, I'm still on this. See, this is why I have this. If it, uh, you can't get it in the middle, that's a psychological issue. Pull the target up close, take the weight off of your bars, preset, pin on, then peep. If it leaves when you're trying to aim, you can get it in the middle, but it leaves when you're trying to shoot. Usually the, the indicator of that, I'm watching somebody shoot, they're taking an archery lesson, and I go, uh, does your pen leave the target all the time when you're trying to shoot your release? And they're like, how do you know? And I can see their elbow is above their arrow, right? It usually comes from this, right? You can fix that when you pull the bow back. Just turn that off, right? So you can do it that way. Or when you pull the bow back, depending on the length of your segments from here to here, right, and here to here, depends on what position that your wrist needs to be in order to get the load, which is the D-loop, the thing that you're pulling on, and the lever in line with each other, right? So how would I draw this back and how would I touch my anchor without getting my elbow above the arrow, right? You'll see that a lot where people pull the bow back and then they raise their shoulder to get to their anchor and their elbows up here. So if I pull on the bow, you can see where the dot would naturally go. If I'm hauling up on the back end, the dot's gonna go down, right? But if I allow my wrist to be loose and flexible when I anchor, and if I anchor with this movement here instead of this movement here, right? I can bend my wrist so that my elbow can stay in position and I can touch my anchor just like this. So that way I have a straight line from the D-loop to the end of the lever. So when I haul on that, I can see that the pin stays in the middle. Without weight on your bars, you can see this clearly and you can practice it. Pull the bow back, get set, and pull on it and see if the pin stays in the middle, right? If people have a hard time, Feeling that, coaches, if you're trying to show them how to do that, put their elbow against the wall so that their elbow is stuck and then they can practice 
with a string bow or whatever, and they can practice aiming with their elbow in one place. They can also practice turning off that back shoulder with their elbow. Folks want to do this with their hands, and the, your hand shouldn't go up and down when you do that. It's just the shoulder. So just put your elbow against the wall, and there you go. You got it, right? So if the sight falls, coaches, if you see that elbow, it's up above the arrow, chances are they're struggling keeping the dot in the middle, right? And you can watch the end of their bar, and it's going. You see them trying to get it in there. Just sitting in a chair behind them, watching them shoot, and just watch the end of the bar. It'll tell you exactly where the arrow is going to hit. So that way you can diagnose a lot of stuff just by watching the movement of the end of the bar, and you know right where it's going to go before they even turn it loose. So the first, first 15 arrows of somebody's lesson, a lot of times I'm just sitting there watching them shoot, watching the bars and watching their form, and every time they let go, I'm trying to predict where I think the arrow's gonna go based on w assuming that their pin was on it, right? I'm, I'm trying to figure out, okay, that should've hit a little bit high and right, and then I look down there, yep, high and right, you know? And then that way, after about 15 arrows, I know what I'm gonna tell them, and I know what the biggest thing is that they need to fix that day, right? Whatever it might be. Sometimes people could fly in and I got to tell them everything at once. And I was like, okay, let's write all this down because you're not going to be able to remember all this by the time we get done. And I have to just dump everything and then they go home and work on it one by one. But if you have somebody that you're seeing regularly, you just tell them the one thing and just work on the one big thing and then just start checking their boxes until their accuracy improves, right? So this one. This one's super common too. It's right in the middle. Oh yeah, baby, there it is. Come on, release. Where you at? I really need this to shoot now. Please shoot, ah, right? So the dip bang. The dip bang is a loss of pressure at full draw. When you're at full draw and you shift from shooting the bow, the actual action that you need to make the bow fire, you shift from that to keep the pin in the middle and be still. It's really hard to get your brain to move while you're trying to get that pin to stay in the middle. So fixing the form things that allows you to move while maintaining pin position, that's getting everything in line with the target from the start, then you can apply, you know, always on dynamic pressure against the bow and the pin will stay in the middle. But it's shooting the bow that makes it still, not holding the bow. Because it's really tough or impossible to hold the bow at an exact state you're either going to be adding or you're going to be letting it subtract, right? If your hands are always moving apart at a microscopic level and the bow is what's holding them together, the bow will be steady. But if the bow are pulling your hands together at a microscopic level, you'll lose pressure. And the dip bang, usually it's just vertical unsteadiness. It just kind of does this. And that's your muscles constantly recruiting more muscle strength because you're releasing half of what's holding the bow, that pressure. It's like the bridge cable holds the bridge up out of the water, and if you release the bridge cable, the bridge sags, right? The bow is the bridge, the bow string is the cable, right? So when you're holding that back at full draw, it needs to be always on. The reason that you get that sudden just jerk is because the bearings, the way they make our bows now, they have that uh, roller bearing in there. And after a little while from the wheel only moves like a quarter turn, right? Or three quarter turn, it only goes about like this much. So what happens is when that bow shoots the arrow over and over and over again, the peaks of all those little ball bearings end up denting the track that they're rolling against S slightly enough to where there's extra friction in there. 
So you can leak pressure, leak pressure, leak pressure until you overcome that friction and the wheels move. That's when you end up with the bounce, right? So always on pressure fixes that. When you go home and try this out, pull as hard as you can on the bow and shoot it. You'll discover that you can't really use too much pressure, but you can definitely lose pressure easily, right? So if you add three or four more pounds of extra pressure at full draw, you'll have enough residual to make your release fire and you'll avoid the dip bangs, right? Uh, here's another super common. Top target looks really good. The middle target is a tiny bit loose and the bottom target's all over the place. We're all getting ready for Lancaster. All y'all are laughing. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? So would you believe that this is that uphill, downhill, bend at the waist thing, right? It doesn't seem like a lot, but your angle changes. You draw the bow above the target and kind of put everything on and then anchor. That's the top bullseye. But each time that you go to the next bullseye, you draw the bow back and then you have to go down to here. And then the third target, you have to go down to here. So you're downhill, things get a little bit out of line and broken, they become unsteady, and that's what your group looks like at the end of the day on the bottom target. But if you pull the bow back, get level with the target you're gonna shoot at, put the pin on it, and then look through the peep, that will go away instantly. It's an instant fix. Even with developmental shooters that are in the 280 range, they can see an instantaneous change just by orienting the pin on the middle before they look through the peep, fixes it just like that, no problem. So vertical scatter, this again, just like the dip bang, this is variable pressure while aiming. If you're aiming and the pressure is leaking and the aim breaks and it's vertical, without weights on the bars, you can see this shockingly clear. You can see it, all right? So if you see vertical aim or vertical scatter in your arrows, another thing that it can also be is that if you have a great group that's round and solid in the middle, but some outliers high and low, in most cases, that synchronization of your cams. One cam is just a twist or so out. And that slight leak of pressure makes those cams release the string a little bit at an angle to the flat line toward the target. So if the knot travels, you know, if one cam is out, the knot travels from high to low. If the other cam is out, it goes from low to high, causing you to hit either high or low, depending on which cam is out of joint, right? This one, kind of a right scatter. That is what uh, rifle people call a pre-ignition movement. That's that time that you're shooting a pistol and then you pull the trigger one more time on an empty chamber and it goes like that. That's always in there and you're sighted in for that if you don't have really good release aid technique. If you're punching a trigger or if you're you know, running that with your hand rather than with your form, right? You may end up with this. This is a right-handed shooter's pattern. Left-handed shooter just flip that. So as coach, ev all, everybody, nobody learns how to shoot a release. I was talking to Joe about this. How do you teach people? What release do you start them with? You know, that sort of thing. I'll, I'll answer that question now. If I have someone that's never shot a bow before and they want to switch to compound, I can hand them a hinge release, but no bow. And their first lesson is us sitting in a chair and just clicking the release and learning how the release operates and how much pressure you can put on it, what the hand manipulation is to make it work. And I make sure that they fully understand how that works and can do it. No problem with a piece of string. Then I move them to the bow, we go blank bail, we do that a lot, then target at close range, and then we walk it out. And then they have good release aid technique. 
almost no one will tolerate the slow build and learning to get up to the point that you'll actually give them an arrow, right? We shorthand that little step of development. Later, we're going to have to go back and pick that up again if we're going to advance because we'll get to a point, your junior shooters or your beginners that you've taught, will get to a point to where they're shooting really good groups and they're reaching for that extra couple of points and then they start doing this. And you're like, ah, okay, uh, I see you got a little right scatter. Come over here. Let me show you a training technique. We're going to do this training technique. And that's when you go back and pick up the release aid technique at close range on a target, show them how to walk it out, kind of gamify it a little bit, right? So they got to go back and pick this up. If you see that pattern before they start really jerking and punching on the release, before they actually lose control of what it is that they're doing, it's a super easy fix and you can just get through it just like that. If it gets to the point where they just don't have control over the bow, they can't not punch it, they can't leave and look through the peep side. I've had some so bad they just, they just turn it loose before they could even hardly look through the peep. I switch them to like a pressure activated release so it teaches them the pulling pressure. And because they've hit that point where they have zero control, they're gonna listen and they're gonna go through every little step because they wanna get good at it, right? So they're gonna go, okay, I'll do whatever. Okay, here's this pressure activated release and here's a target right up here, right? And then you just walk them through the process. Once somebody masters a pressure sensitive release, you can stick any release in the stream with good technique and they can shoot that one too. So. Starting them off with a pressure or a hinge or something like that is fine if they're new. If you're teaching someone that's already started going with the button or whatever, start them with a pressure, get the technique under control, and then uh, move them on to something else. But it usually helps and it usually makes it work a little quicker if you just switch the release. If they've lost control, just switch to something new. So that way they have to learn it, right? Yeah, like an Evolve, you know, a Stamp Perfex, you know, all of, those, uh, all of those releases that you just let go of the trigger and then pull on them until they fire, any of those. There's half a dozen of them yeah. out there now, right? So here's another, that low and left. This one is becoming more and more common because I see often people's heads follow their release. It looks kind of like, like this. And you can imagine, if I do it in this direction, why my arrows would be scattering low and to the left. The fix for that is usually pretty simple. Here, stand up, you'll be my crash test dummy. Is I'll tell them when they're, when they're shooting the bow, right, they're out here, and I say, I want you to just keep this up on target and when the release breaks, it just goes here, and that's it. So I'll start off by stopping their head from moving backwards, stand behind them with my hand just an inch away from them, and when they go like that, they feel me stop them. And then I can get up here and be this far away, and as soon as their release goes off, just stop their hand. Usually that takes once, or you can, you can, you can let go. Usually that takes once or twice and they got it. And it's something that you have to practice. But over exaggerating that so that it looks super fancy is one of the best things you can do to save a shot when you're nervous. If you ever see me out at an event and I'm holding that bow up there like two seconds longer, you know I'm freaking out and I'm trying to keep it together. So what I do is I focus on the follow through because I've been using the same shot for 35 years. So I know how, how I shoot a bow, right? So if I focus on the complete end of the process, my brain lines up everything I need to achieve that shape because I've done it a bajillion times. So if I just go, okay, no matter what, I'm up here, I'm shaking like a leaf. I look like an idiot. I'm just gonna try to hit these. So I'm just gonna follow through. So if I miss this really bad, anybody that watched me shoot it is gonna say he did everything he could do, right? 
so I can at least do everything I can do to get it in the middle, and that's with a good, clean, solid follow-through. Most of the time, it hits. Your pen may be flashing all over the place, and somehow or another, it ends up in the middle. How many of you have shot that arrow, and you were like, where'd it hit? <laughs> and it's in the middle, right? You know, that works. And it seems silly that you just have to think about it a different way, right? And it all of a sudden starts to behave. That's like the kid, uh, my bow's all over the place. I can't hit anything. My scores are in the tank. I don't know what to do. 20 minutes later, they send me a message that says, I put three twists in my bowstring and that fixed everything. We know three twists in the bowstring didn't move his draw length a hundred thousandths, right? But it fixed it for him, right? And all he was really doing was just thinking about it a different way, right? Say what? Yeah, the new bow syndrome, man, that works great. I shoot my best scores as soon as the new bow of the year comes in. I always shoot my best scores. I put it on Instagram and say, hey, look, I still know how to shoot. But then three weeks later, I'm back to normal. <laughs> Almost every time. <laughs> right? So to review, take all the weight off. Shoot the bow a lot without the weight and adjust your form according to what you see. Work on the elbow, work on the shoulder, work on the overall pressure. Take your tuxedo off and just shoot normal, right? Relax and settle into the shape. Don't try to hold it so rigid and tight, right? Um, work through the list one piece at the time. So now you've got the list of things that you can walk through that promote stability in your bow, right? So when you go through that list, then you can walk the weight back on. You don't, your form is different now. It's cleaner, it's more relaxed, it's more stable. You only need just enough weight to keep the bow still while it's changing shape and the arrow is being pushed out of the bow, right? So walk the weight on in small increments, put one on the front, two on the back, shoot with that for a little while. And you have to shoot with it long enough that the placebo effect of adding more weight wears off, right? And then add another and two more. And I'm, I'm saying just, you know, one on the front and two on the back. If you have a 30 inch bar and a 15 inch bar, that would be one and two so that you're offsetting the leverage of the front bar with the back bar, right? Everybody's got that. Okay. So bring the weight up in small amounts and you'll see clearly when you hit the point that you've added one too many. And it'll be like, oh, no, I'm having a hard, I'm actually having to like use energy to hold this thing up. I'm having to actually do it rather than it working for me, right? And it'll be clear when you get there if you steadily walk the weight on the bow, right? Okay. So that's it. So who has questions? I'm the greatest presenter in the world. Nobody ever has any questions when I get done. Okay, so... Okay, I see you in the back. That question that you have in your mind that you're gonna come up and ask me when it's over because you're the only one with that problem, I promise you everyone in the room probably needs to hear your, hear your question. So back in the back. So when you're talking about walking the weight back on, right? I, I mean, I think that most people will get to a point where they have too much weight. What are some things that we would see either in a pin flow in our, you know, reading our target or whatever, that like, oh, you need to go back down, you've added too much, or is it purely it's not necessarily a fatigue thing, but it is a feel thing. You'll notice that you're having to like consciously correct aim, right? You have, when you pull back, when you have your form right and the weight is right on your bow, or even with no weight, when you pull back, put the pin on and look through the peep, everything is there and it's ready when you look through the peep. You don't have to wait on it to get ready and get stable before you begin shooting, right? When you end up with too much weight and you look through the peep, it's not ready, right? You're, you'll have to wait on it for a minute to settle down. You'll have to wait on it a minute to get it up into the middle, you know, like those things. But as long as you pull back, pin on, 
peep and it's ready to go, you're in a good spot, right? Adding more weight will make the bow seem more steady. You know, you put a concrete cinder block on the bottom of your bow and it's gonna really make it super still, but it will not hit what you're shooting at because the mistake that you're making is still there. And we've all noticed that when we pull our bow back and look through it, just in the state that it is right now, we've all noticed when we pull back, look through, and it's super steady for just a second, and then it starts moving. Because it takes a minute for that form mistake to get the mass moving, but once weight is in motion, it stays in motion, right? So it'll get bigger and bigger and bigger until you stay with it and just shoot an eight, or you have to let down and reset and do it again, right? Who else? Yeah. So when you say weight off, is that weight off the bars, but leave the bars on or just take the bars totally off? I like to leave the bars on because it does, just the bars being there does change the behavior of the bow on release. So I like to leave them on. I've done it both ways. The bars on seems to be the cleanest way to do that. Okay. You know, and it's more representative of what you're really gonna get when you're shooting. Well, form is draw length, right? So yes, but in most cases, if you're, the peak of your shoulder hurts a little bit, or if you're having a hard time getting this one down, or if this one always wants to migrate up while you're aiming, in most cases, that's a signal that the draw length is too short, right? And I find that very often, years ago, I was shortening everyone's draws because the pro shops were handing everybody, this is 25 years ago, I was shortening everyone's draws because the pro shops hand them a 30 inch bow. Everybody is, you know, 30 inches, 20, uh, 30 inches, 70 pounds. This is everybody. So I was ended up shortening everybody's draw length. Well now in the last, you know, 10 or 15 years, I'm lengthening everyone's draw length. It seems like, uh, add more draw length, add more draw length. I'm going through a whole room of people. Yep, your draw length's a little bit too short. You know, I try to phrase it in a different way so I don't sound like a broken record, but you know, the best way to tell when you're at home alone, right, or get somebody to watch you, often we pull the bow back and kind of dress ourselves into it and then look through the peep, right? So if I do this, and if the string and everything is right on my face, you'd say, yeah, that looks pretty good. That draw length fits, but then watch. There's three inches, you see? So somebody can conceal that without even knowing it. The only thing that they know is their shoulders hurt like crazy after they've shot 60 arrows, right? So here's how you figure it out. If you draw the bow and don't go to the peep, don't anchor right away, settle your shoulders, line everything. You see how I kind of take the Z out of it and straighten it out and turn your head and look straight forward while you're getting that set and you go, yeah, I'm straight and then go. Sometimes I do that with people and the string is all the way out here, right? And that's a really good way to just kind of eliminate that quick little dress that you do to get in the bow so that you can see how long is it really. Another thing you can do is continually Continually release the draw length, let it out, let it out, let it out, let it out, let it out until it's obviously too long, right? Shoot it like that for a little while and get used to it. You're watching, you're no weight on the bars again. You're watching the pin movement and with a long draw length, it'll be kind of loose and it'll wander, but it'll be very predictable. Right, you'll know where it's going and how long it's gonna to take to get there, right? How long it's gonna stay, but it'll be pretty wide. And as you shorten the draw length, right, you've got the width, and as you shorten the draw length, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller until you hit the zone. Now you're in the sweet spot, and then you go a little bit more, and it starts to be jerky. If you ever get the feeling that your pin jerks off the middle just for your release to go off, that's a signal that your draw length is a little bit short, right? But I find that if you set it long where it's a little bit on the too long side and get used to that, 
So you get used to the feeling of being extended and fully in it, right? And then when you're watching the pen movement and then you shorten the draw a tiny amount, you can see an instant improvement. And then you go, oh, this is even better, right? And you can zero in on that. Now there's a little magic trick that you can do with draw length. For world archery stuff, is anyone outside listening to the door? Okay, shh. For world archery stuff, we gotta hit the inner X. And if you miss that inner X, it doesn't matter how far out in the yellow you are, it's still a nine. And we all try to, you know, soften the blow. You know, it would have been a Vegas 10, but it was a nine, right? But it's, it's a nine, in world archery, it's a nine. So we know that a shorter draw length, a slightly shorter draw length, it, for you it may be an eighth inch less. For some it could be as much as a quarter inch less, right? It'll tighten up the hold so it occupies a smaller space, but you, you, you have the risk of bigger mistakes, Whoosh, really big, right? But if you can maximize the number of inner tens that you hit, you can get a higher score shooting a slightly shorter draw length, make it tight. But for NFAA National Indoor, Vegas, you know, any of those, there's a penalty for missing the Big Ten. So you want to have your draw length a little bit closer to the sweet spot where the float is a little more slow, no jerky mistakes at all, right? And then you can cruise and shoot a 300, a 600, and then a 900. Depending on where you have that float set up, you might sacrifice an X or two unless you're shooting big arrows. I shoot 2315s all the time because that's what shoots the best out of my indoor bow. I can't make 27 size arrows shoot better than my 2315s. So I shoot those all the time. So by setting my draw length kind of in that sweet spot, my X count isn't very flashy. You know, I might be 25, 26 Xs. Where, you know, top pros are like, eh, yeah, it's all right, right? But I get a 900 a lot but the X count isn't all that flashy. So to get in the shoot off, you got to win the qualification, which is you got to clean all the big tens, you got to clean all the X's, just to get in the tournament, which is that 20 person free for all that we go through at Vegas, right? So knowing what the effects of your draw length is, you can maximize your chances of getting your best score even when you're under pressure. Now, getting all this working and beautifully sitting on the target, your release is popping and you're absolutely loving it, right? Then you got to take it on the road because everything changes when the extra distractions in the room are different. When you're in your home range, nothing special happens. Nothing there out of the ordinary goes down. You don't have to protect yourself. Your attention span isn't spread out wider in the room. So you can use all of your bandwidth for shooting your bow. But when you step into Vegas or some league that you've never been in before and you feel a little bit out of place, you feel observed, you feel pill pressure, you feel competed against, you know, all of those psychological things that make us nervous, right? We have to experiment with our new stuff in those environments so when we spread our bandwidth out because we're in a different environment, right? We got to make sure everything still works easy. So the next step, once you're like totally money at home, you got to find every little place, every little league, sit down, round, money, shoot, you know, shoot off, anything that you can find, go to all of them. And it's even better if you have that shop or league or club or whatever that you might feel unwelcome in, right? It's a competing club or shop. And then you roll up in there and shoot your bow. That whole new psychological environment, right, will make you shoot different. So if you put yourself in that situation enough, you figure out how to be normal no matter what the environment is. And we all know toward the end of the indoor season, our game works a little bit better. But those first couple of shoots, we're kind of freaks when we're out there. It's like, oh my God, what's going on? You know, pins everywhere. I don't even know why that hit there, right? So in the preliminary, September, October, November, 
Dece you know, all the way through December, if you're hitting those little leagues and things to get yourself ready for the first big event of the year, you'll have better success in the beginning. Are there any more questions? Oh, that is, well, I need some, I need some mechanism to like draw on, but let me, let me figure that out right quick. I think I can figure that out because I'm running this presentation on, a, on the, uh, so you know, you know that if you overestimate your yardage, it doesn't miss as much as if you underestimate. Right? So knowing that is key. So uh, without drawing a picture, I'll try to explain it. An 80-yard field face, the dot is the same size as the 10 in a McKenzie target. Right? Roughly. It's pretty, pretty close. I put a little sticker dot down at the very bottom of that. This was back when I was judging yards. I shoot known now. I don't even bother with judging yardage. But if you're trying to judge, if you put a sticker dot down at the bottom, and let's say most bows, 280, 283, something like that, set your pin on 40 and stand at 40 and shoot at that little dot at the bottom of the spot on an 80-yard field face and continue inching your way forward until your arrows leave the top of that 10 ring. That will be a gap that you can aim at the bottom of the 10 or aim on the 12 and still be inside the 10 if you're wrong. It tells you how much to overestimate. Most of the time, not me, but most of the time, you can tell the difference between 20 and 35, right? Not me, I'll shoot a 20 for 35 all day long, but most people that actually judge distance. So if you can set, I set a gap, I figure out what my gap is. If I wanna be really exact, the old Buckmaster, when the, when the plate would pop up, right? The plate was like this tall, so you had a really big gap. So I had a pen set up for near, medium, and far. So I didn't have to judge or do anything. If it was in the middle of the floor, I put the middle pen on it. If it was on the long end of the floor, I put the long pen on it and short pen for the close ones, and just put the pin on it and let it go, right? For, to be a little bit more exact, for IBO, just staying in the 10 ring and picking up more 12s, you can set, figure out what your close and your medium and your far, and if you walk up there and look at it, and you have no idea what the distance is, you know it's somewhere in between 30 and 40, you know where to put your pin and where to aim so that you can catch it at the top if you're wrong on the really close side. Does that make sense for everybody? Right? So I use that for bow hunting too. I can have a close, medium, and far, so I can make a stamp decision and shoot an arrow and still be in the zone, right? That was the, that was the yardage trick. It wasn't how to judge yardage more accurately, it was how to hit it not knowing the yardage exactly, right? Anybody else? Back there? We're talking about like lenses in our scope. Uh huh. What, what magnification do you like to start people at? Or is there, you know, kind of like whatever you want? You know, because like I know, like, if you have like a six power, you're going to see a lot more float as you will a four power. Definitely, yeah. I take a good guess based on the person and getting to know the person while we're setting their bow up and shooting and kind of getting an idea. If they're very elementary and developmental, I'll put like a two just so they don't have to deal with unsteadiness while they're working out archery technique. Or if I'm dealing with somebody that's like a fast talker and they're all over the place, shifting gears, you know, the ADD type, I keep them in the lower power with a little bit bigger dot. As they master what they're doing, they'll walk up in power until they hit their spot. 
Some people can't shoot more than a four. I think Jesse shoots a four power. He might go to five maybe, but he doesn't get any higher than that. I use an eight, which is obscene for most people, but I got used to shooting my bow with that buzzy sight movement, and I feel more comfortable having a bigger field of view so I can really see where I'm putting my pen, and I use a bigger dot that's about the size of the 10 ring. So uh, you may or may not have seen the, the biter uh, lens system. They have a hole drilled in there, and they got little pegs that you can stick in there that make the dots bigger as you go up in the pegs, and I use that to figure this out. But I would start off with a four power, and then I went all the way up through the array of pegs to the biggest four millimeter dot size. Then I went to a six power lens, went all the way up in the dot sizes, then went to an eight, went all the way up in the dot sizes, and I figured out that I shot the tightest groups and had the best score with an eight power with a pretty fat dot. For me, I didn't do well with the small one and even with a commiserate size dot as the eight, I still didn't do as well because I feel like I just couldn't see as much. So it's very individual, but new people, I start them off on low power and then walk it in. Anybody else? Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. The balance disc will help a good bit with this too because that changes your balance a good deal. But I have another little trick that I use for that with kids that can't feel it is I have like a two inch wide piece of webbing. Big, long, two inch wide strap with a buckle on it. And I have them, I loop it over their shoulder and have them stand on it and just stand like this and then just pull it to where it's kind of snug right there. And then I give them a bow that's like, I have a little four pound training bow. Bear Archery used to make those. And I have the one that I learned on. The guy came and gave it to me when I opened up my shop, right? But uh, I got a little four pound bow so they can pick it up and they can pull it back and see what it feels like because the strap gives them some feedback so they can tell where this is. I do it for the front shoulder. I do it for the back shoulder. And if you put a cross in the strap and orient the cross right here, then you can give them feedback on whether if they're leaning back, right? And it's kind of fun for them because they're all like strapped up and you're like, okay, give this a try. And then you'll say, I bet you can't do it with this. Let's try this. And then it's a challenge that they get it right. And when they're eight, your job really, when they're that young, is to make them fall in love with archery. You don't have to belabor form and make them do repetitious things and all. It makes it too much like school, right? Pop balloons, give them one little thing, occasional reminders, let them pop balloons and just have a good time. Come up with a fun training exercise like stepping on and off the balance disc, you know. And you can slowly bring those lessons in while keeping it fun. But... If you don't do anything else but just make them fall in love with archery, when they're a cadet or they're in the under 18 division and it's an absolute bloodbath and they have to work their butts off just to get anywhere, they'll actually go through the work because they're in love with shooting bow. They're not in love with the idea of winning the tournament. If they're in love with the idea of getting sponsored by a bow company, or they're in love with the idea of winning the event. If they don't win the event, or they don't get sponsored by somebody, they're gonna quit. Or, I've seen some, all they wanted to do was just be sponsored and recognized by a bow company. The minute they got that, they stopped shooting. So, make them in love with the process of learning how to be good, and then they'll stick the longest because they love doing the thing not what the thing will get for them, right? So that way it's not results-based. Their love for it isn't results-based, it's activity-based. Say, like, oh good, I get to shoot my bow today. 
that, that'll be the best to keep your club, keep people in archery as long as you can, right? I have one more question. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, it's just kind of a strange problem. Um, do, you, do we actually recognize this through archery that she, <coughs> when she thinks, she doesn't have an inner monologue? She, um, like, I asked her questions about how did that feel? What did you think about that? What were you, what were you thinking when you were in the car room? I don't know. And I was just wondering if you could ever have this dude. <laughs> I'd love her to know. Um, she just started out really well. Now she's Mm -hmm. and, and I don't want her to stop because obviously I want her to and but I don't know how to teach her anymore like when she's got this weird and I just was wondering if you had an answer so I do this thing to keep my brain my decision maker turned on when I'm shooting because it's really easy to just get in the flow of shooting and your brain turns off and then you make a mistake right so under my breath, when I step up to the line with my bow, even if I'm practicing, I do everything the same, is I'm talking to myself, okay, let me get this right, right? And that little, okay, let me get this right, that turns my brain, okay, we're shooting now, right? And I have a particular point that when I snap my arrow on the string, that's the point that I shrink my my attention span and I get really into what it is. I'm as ADD as anybody could ever get, right? So when, if I don't do it on purpose, I will be paying attention to stuff going on in the show up there in the top. I'll be hearing conversations over there and I'll have everything going at once and I'll make a mistake. But by intentionally, I give myself a point and say, okay, you have to concentrate when you shoot. Okay, yeah, sure. When do you start concentrating, right? And for me, it's when I snap the arrow on the string and then I'm talking to myself. All right, let's get this right. All right, fingers, grip, target. All right, here we go. Doop, doop, pin, peep, bang. Oh yeah, that was good. That's exactly what I want. Yeah, I really want that. And then I go through the process again. And for her, if you, A, make it easy, give her just one thing. Because she's probably got a whole bunch of other stuff going on. And that I don't know means that she was probably rolling something in her head that didn't have anything to do with archery. Right? So if you give her something verbal that she can just do under her breath where nobody else can hear, give it one thing and just kind of keep it easy and set her up to get some sort of success that you can measure. It can be anything. You know, the last thing it'll be is score, right? But it'll be, did you catch her setting her fingers right in the release before she moved on to the next step? If you caught her this many times in a row, success, man, you shattered your record, man. You did it six times in a row this time. I've been watching. I can tell. I can tell that it's working. You're doing really good, right? Come up with any way to get some sort of success because we all know if you're going to the gym all the time and you're starving yourself to death and you're not losing any weight, you're going to go buy a cake, right? <laughs> Because you're, you know, if you're not getting results for all the work, if there's nothing that you can see is getting better, you're not going to stick to it, right? And that's kind of the bubble when people get up into that area that the skipped steps or lack of athletic ability or whatever starts making it hard for a little while. You got to come up with some other way to measure or show success or progress so that they can get through that little rough spot. And you know, if you put it on a graph, it would be, you suck, you suck, you suck, you really suck. Oh God, this is bad. And right about here is where everybody quits, right? But just on the other side of that, when your brain gets all the wires twisted together and it starts to click, it takes off and your scores take off, right? So find some way to keep her in it with just any measurable success at all that she can see. You can't make it up because she won't trust you.
It's got to be something that she can see and feel, right? Anybody else? Okay, thanks for coming out, everybody.